Welcome, ladies and gents. Thank you for stopping by today. We are always delighted here at Red Eyes Radio to have you with us. Thank you for tuning in. My name is Henrik, and this is a non-conformist, free-thinking, and critical, independent radio program that oppose all the uh, current politically correct nonsense that is uh, leading to horrible self-censorship and a horrible climate of fear and repression with uh, cultural Marxism as the ruling ideology, whether people are actually smart enough to realize that or not. We oppose the globalists and the bankers and their lying politicians, and uh, we sense that they will do to us what they have done to, for example, Greece, and that their policies against us ultimately are revealing themselves to be extremely hostile to who we are. We are concerned for the future of Western civilization, and the European peoples, and we are proud guardians of our interests unapologetically. We are also into global politics, basically trying to understand why things are the way they are. Health, science, new technology, conspiracies, secret societies, corruption, political subversive movements, history, culture, archaeology, and much more. We are, to uh, make things simple, looking for the truth, and we are uh, not afraid to bring people on to uh, talk about the findings along the way. On our website, redeyescreations.com, redeyesradio.net, and redeyesmembers.com, we have much more for you to uh, check out. Our guest today is uh, Mike King. He's been with us a couple of times before. He is a private investigative journalist and researcher based in the New York City area. His 27-year career in marketing and advertising has equipped him with a, a unique perspective when it comes to understanding how public opinion is scientifically manufactured. Welcome back, Mike. It's uh, good to speak with you again. I hope you've been doing well. And uh, as always, it's a, it's a pleasure to have you with us. Uh, it's good to be back, Henrik. Yes, we're keeping busy, uh, try, trying to keep up with uh, these rapid flow of events that are unfolding. Yeah, it seems like it's going quicker now than, than ever before. We have, we have so many things we want to want to speak about. And of course, as you said, you've been keeping busy since we last uh, spoke. A lot of interesting articles on tomatobubble.com. But also, of course, uh, and by the way, I'm really enjoying your anti-New York slimes post. Uh, a couple of great stories there that we uh, hopefully can get a chance to discuss a bit later as well. But um, I wanted to talk a little bit about some of your latest books first before we get into some of the other topics we have lined up here for today but you have uh well since we last spoke i think you have multiple outs you have mind mind side of the story key world war ii addresses of adolf hitler um which, which of course is outrageous to actually try to listen to what he actually said as opposed to what people believe he said etc but then you have um killing of america a hundred year murder for the historical wounds bill o'reilly didn't write about and also you have a two volumes of Planet, Planet Rothschild, The Forbidden History of the New World Order. And neither of these books is a small topic, and we can do a program on each book separately, of course. But let's see if we can make uh, them some justice here and talk about each of them for a little bit, Henry. And I wanted to begin on Planet Rothschild first. It was actually a few uh, years ago now on Red Eye since we kind of dedicated a show talking more about the Rothschild family. This is, of course, the family that the mainstream media never writes about they they can spend a huge amounts of time and effort you know attacking some you know like the Koch brothers or something like that but they never talk about the Rothschild and how powerful this this Jewish banking family is tell us a bit first of um you know how you approached the topic Mike and, and why you wanted to write a book on on the Rothschilds well um uh, you know this this thing this 250 year old uh, drama that we call the New World Order, uh, which uh, I'm sure most of your listeners know, dates back uh, to about the time of the French Revolution. Uh, at its heart, has always been this uh, this family. Uh, it's not just the Rothschilds, of course, uh, but without them, it's it's hard to envision how this effort could have proceeded. And when you understand that. Uh, you get a better picture of the continuity. You know, people often say, well, why would all these conspirators engage uh, in this massive effort that, which they knew would never come to fruition during their lifetime? 
But when you see the bloodlines going from century to century to century, uh, you know, it begins to make sense. And, and that's where the, uh, the book starts, Planet Rothschild, 1763 to 2015. It's a two-volume set. And, and I begin with the foundation of the House of Rothschild in 1763. And I go through all the major events of the last 250 years. And you see the influence of this family throughout. Whether it was the um, uh, Nathan Rothschild's single-handed financing of the defeat of Napoleon, right up to the modern day, we see the Rothschilds involved in Israel and in the global warming hoax. And it, it's just incredible how this has passed. It, it truly is a dynasty. Um, they are at the heart of planet Rothschild. And it's essential to understand this family if you're going to understand the big picture of things. Tell us a bit about how you think they actually managed to get uh, the the control that they did in in Europe at the time. Because I mean, obviously, as we know, there was um, many you you know European countries were uh, were, were throwing out uh, the Jewish people from various locations. It was over eleven hundred places over a, an eight hundred year period, uh, from small little chiefdoms and areas to to entire countries. But uh, it was the Jewish imagination emancipation didn't occur until 18, 1850, something like that. And I've always been curious about how they managed to get such a control. And, and it, I mean, is it as simple as some have said that it was basically a, um, they were in a position to lend money to various kings that were engaged in war, etc.? Or how did they get that foot in the door, if you will, Mike? Well, the, um, the big, I mean, the big move was, well, you know, you had the, the five sons of the original Rothschild branched out to five different countries, uh, Britain, France, uh, Frankfurt in Germany, uh, Austria, and then what was known at, at the time as the Kingdom of uh, Naples. But the biggest brother of all was, was Nathan. And what Nathan managed to do is conquer England. And England at that time, um, and for several centuries, uh, was what the United States was today, meaning if you control the United Kingdom, you can leverage that power uh, to control well, the world, essentially. So although you had the five brothers in five different lands, it, it, the key to this was Nathan in London, who uh, by the time Napoleon came on the scene, he, Nathan Rothschild was already immensely wealthy, rich enough to finance the war to defeat Napoleon, who was opposed to usury. Uh, and, and he played the war in such a way as to multiply his fortune by as much as 20 times. So it, the the fortune, the Rothschild fortune, is, is just unimaginable. Uh, I mean, some people feel they may actually, you know, as, the, as an entity, be the world's first and only trillionaires. Uh, but that's, that's, that's the key, the capture of the, uh, the, the British Empire, because that's what led to the defeat of Napoleon, who was uh, very much feared by the, the early New World Order. Interesting. Yeah, I mean, what, what would you say about, um, as you said, though, I mean, they, they have so much money, it's, it's um, kind of difficult to estimate. I've heard some people estimate, and it's, you know, in my view, we, there's just no way of knowing with all the different assets and whatnot. But one thing we've noticed, of course, is that they very much, uh, they're a very quiet family. They're they're kept largely out of the media. They do surface a little bit here and there, some controversy, some scandals with, you know, with buyouts. There's been rumors of involvement in, in various things. But how do they manage to stay out of the media? Are they? Do you know, Mike, if they're directly in ownership, in control of some of the large uh, media companies? Because it seems to be kind of a an agreed upon topic to to not write too much about them. Well, wh one thing I've noticed about them is in all of their their ownership techniques, it's it's like they're there, but they're hidden. It's it's very similar to uh, you know the, the way the mafia. The Italian mafia used to operate in in America. They they might have a front man owning the hotel, uh, but the details of the true ownership is kind of you know arcane. It's, it, it's hard to get at. So they've always been there, like amongst the elite. Everyone knows who they are. Uh, in terms of the the public, they still to this day kind of remain always somewhat under the radar. 
which indicates to me that they still are uh, the true power. Uh, I, I believe they are. They continue to be the power behind George Soros, for example, who, by comparison, is very open uh, in public. And you know, by this time, it's um, there's a lot of other players who are part of this thing, and it's hard to say if the Rothschilds are the absolute pinnacle. Uh, it, to me, it seems more like an oligarchy, oligarchy at this point, a conspiracy among elite equals. Uh, but certainly, up until you know, First World War, World War II, they were the at the apex of the, of the New World Order, and, and they still might be, although there's very, you know, there, there, there are other big players, uh, to be sure. Right. To this day, they, I mean, you'll see them, you'll see some of these uh, Rothschilds maybe make a cameo appearance on a BBC or something like that. They're not totally hidden. Um, but they're, they're not out there front and center to the degree that a, uh, a George Soros or a David Rockefeller is. Isn't that kind of ridiculous, though, when you think about the progressive and liberal media that can attack, you know, the, as I said, the Koch brothers and they go after them like they own the world and everything. Like, oh, my God, they donated to the GOP, but they largely never discuss the real, you know, major big power players, which is indicative of how kind of phony and, and controlled the uh, these kinds of exposés are. Well, this whole business of uh, tax the rich and attack the rich uh, is is something that, to quote uh, Michael Corleone from The Godfather, he's, he once said that income taxes are a trick of the rich to keep the others without. <laughs> so uh, but it, it, it is interesting, all of these mega mega billionaires i mean forget about the Koch brothers people like that that's jump change i'm talking about the really big boys you know your, your george soros and your warren buffett and your rockefellers and your rothschilds and they are the one percent of the one percent and they're all left wing so you know really there's a, the attack on the so-called rich is, is an attack on the the entrepreneurial class the real rich the real big shots they never get touched and they're the ones who are behind this demagoguery of, uh, you know, tax the rich and so on. Yeah, I mean, what what do you think their involvement was in terms of the rise of uh, of of socialism and and communism as a way of kind of by proxy to take over, uh, you know, what what we saw in Russia, etc. Are they are there fingerprints all over that as well? Oh yes, absolutely. Uh, you know, the Western financiers, the Jewish financiers, financed the Russian Revolution. And they've always financed and promoted communism and socialism and big government and liberalism, progressivism, whatever, whatever euphemism you want to use. Uh, they're always at the center of it. Now, if you look at it superficially, that appears to be somewhat of a paradox. But it's not because, you see, big government borrows money and goes deeper and deeper into perpetual debt to these people. So they're... Their love of big government has nothing to do with altruism or wealth redistribution. No, big government, I mean, that is your ultimate customer. I mean, if you're a blood-sucking moneylender, uh, you prefer a, a big debtor over a small debtor. And who's bigger than the government? And, and that's the key to understanding everything. These people love big government. And, and through that big government, they control the world. And they've got us all in debt perpetually. Yeah, this is how they play the game, of course. And uh, you think that some of these groups are in opposition to each other, or you would think that certain political ideologies would, would fight the the uh, the real, you know, capitalists, as if you will, the, the real money power. But as I said, they never kind of come to light in in that capacity. What what would you say are some of the kind of major events that stand out i know that you you know you um you go through the chronology of, of events of and, and there's a lot there to discuss and we can't go into them all of course but what what are some of the things that stand out to you when you were writing the book mike and some of the things we should just kind of uh, uh make our listeners aware of well um to to me the the, the most important events would be those points in history in which these people were challenged uh, nearly defeated, uh, sometimes even were defeated, but then always come back and win uh, in the end, and they come out stronger. 
and probably the first major move against these people was the rise of Napoleon. How, how many people know that uh, Napoleon Bonaparte passed a decree against money lending? It was called the infamous decree. And, you know, I've got some quotes in there in Planet Rothschild from some of the things he wrote about usury. And, and, it, and although publicly he was always, uh, you know, portrayed himself as a tolerant, as a friend of the Jews, privately, like in things like letters to his brother, you know, he wanted to assimilate them out of existence. And he had a, a very um, negative view of them and, and, and money lending. But there, there's no question that, uh, you know, had Napoleon remained in, in power, uh, you know, the New World Order could not have advanced. So he had to be destroyed because he was, he was totally opposed to uh, money lending. And what an epic struggle that was. It was, you know, in a sense, it was uh, parallel to the struggle in the 20th century against Hitler. Uh, but Rothschild financed the downfall of Napoleon. And that was, you know, a huge triumph for them. And that they not only came out, you know, more powerful, but they really never had a true uh, challenge against them until Hitler came along more than 100 years uh, later. So things like that I, I spend a lot of time on uh, in the book. And then in, in America there was a similar uh, move against them. That would have been the rise of President Andrew Jackson, who killed America's central bank. Uh, so there's a, there's a whole story there. Uh, yeah, it was another seven. After he killed the bank, it was another 70 years be before they could finally set up the, the Federal Reserve System. So that was a huge setback in America, uh, what Andrew Jackson did. You know, I was wondered because when we have rights of some of these dictators, uh, well, so to speak, dictators, they have, uh, you know, tried to do something which m most people are, I, I think, incapable of, of understanding in terms of, well, really try to clean house and, and take care of some of the major problems that we have. And I'm not saying that there aren't those that have risen to power, of course, that are in the hands of the very same uh, banking families and what have you. But it's interesting because usually we have, we, to me, it's kind of clear that when you have this very cut and dry demonization of certain, uh, you know, people that have risen in history, you know that good chances that they were actually trying to take out some of the competition, that we're trying to clean house and take care and, and restore some kind of, uh, you know, pride either to the, the country itself or maybe even to the entire European Union. Were, were, are there others that have risen and tried to uh, take care of this issue in the past? Uh, yeah, well, the, the big ones, the, the big challenges would have been Napoleon, Andrew Jackson, um, and Hitler. Uh, in a modern context, one could say uh, Putin and, and, and China. Uh, and, and then throughout history, there, there have been many smaller players who have defied this force. And paid the price for it. Uh, if we want to be a little bit simplistic, one can say you can judge the degree of, of a man's commitment to his own people uh, by the um, the, le the level of filth that is dumped on his head by the press. And, and so you look whether it's a Saddam Hussein or a, a Muammar Gaddafi, uh, or you go back in history, a Mussolini or someone like that. Uh, tip, I mean, you, you, see, you see the pattern. The more negatively someone is portrayed, and this is not to suggest that they're all perfect and saints. Sure, yeah, of course. Uh, that, that, that is the pattern. You look closely and you see someone who is generally opposed to the debt-based monetary system uh, that the Rothschilds are at the heart of. Conversely, all of the so-called great and good statesmen of the last few hundred years, uh, you look a little closer and and you can discern that those are the puppets that were you know placed in power to uh, to move the game forward, and that's pretty much the story of history of the last two hundred and fifty years. You can just uh, kind of reverse everything you hear. The good guys are more or less the bad guys, and the bad guys are more or less truly the good guys. And it's an amazing pattern that comes up time and time and, and time again when you, when you look into it. Yeah, you know, people have no idea what has driven people in the past, individuals, uh, to do certain things politically or 
what their fierce reactions actually was a response to. This is usually just kept out of the history books. I think many are scared of political ideologies that they don't understand, perhaps understandable in these times with all the uh, manipulation going on. I mean, it's easy. The media tells us what political ideologies are bad, right? And that's good because the current rulership we have right now is so benevolent and and it really is looking out for our best interests. So when the media tells us that, for example, nationalism is bad or that fascism is bad, then, you know, that's really good, you know, because we just need to swallow everything hook, line and sinker, uh, what they tell us and, and take everything they say at face value, especially regarding the history of, of these you know, various political tools that exists out there. But, you know, someone pointed out to me once that, uh, for example, fascism was a political tool used to defeat communism, to clean out the Marxist rot. And it doesn't mean that it's the best system to have in place all the time, nor that it's a system that never has its application. I I think we know how much the media lies about everything. I mean, I, I think anyone who listens to this show understands that. But yet, despite that, somehow on certain issues here, we are to believe everything they tell us about, for example, why National Socialism rose to power or what fascism really is, for example. I mean, it's just ridiculous and childish that the version that they give us is something we never should question. Anything that would result in the diminishing power of the globalist, they label fascism. Even those things that would slow down their agenda a little bit, they label fascism. And they call it this whether or not it actually is that. Yet you do have a mass of people, uh, even so-called awake people, who uncritically takes what our current media barons and social engineering masters tell us about, you know, why they are good and that the political tools that would actually put these guys out of power, that must be really, really bad, right? So uh, it seems that people rather want to have the current state of bankers ruling their lives, materialism and the kind of money is smarter than people attitude of free marketeers and corrupt democratic Marxist socialists around their life because they're just too scared to have an iron hand come in and clean up and kick out the banks and try to actually do something that for once is good for the people of the nation because, you know, that's fascism and, and I've just heard so many bad things about it. You know, the, our benevolent leadership have just told us how bad it is. And, uh, you know, I'm in fact even so scared of it that I won't even try to understand it or even why these dictators came to power at all or what they really tried to do. So as long as we can have our precious democracy or our democratic socialism that keeps these globalists in power, you know, I'm happy because after all, they, they've told us that this really is the best system for us, you know? Well, w- one thing that these globalists will always uh, support in, in a country that they are attempting to subvert is democracy. Uh, you know, the founding fathers of America never even used that word. Uh, we were meant to be a representative republic, limited democracy. It was Karl Marx who was a big champion of democracy. And b- because they, you know, they understand that with control of their press and their demagogic politicians, that democracy is the kind of system that can be easily manipulated uh, towards their ends. So, You know, in order to defeat them, I mean, a country that has been infected with the disease of liberalism slash democracy, uh, you know, what is required is a a strong hand uh, approach. Uh, I mean, you know, to me, this business of mobocracy is not natural, where everybody and their mother gets a right to vote, you know, regardless of how stupid they are. Uh, But the globalists love that. They're, They're the ones who promote democracy. And it's not for the quote-unquote people, um, you know, it's, it's, it's for them. So democracy is a tool of s- subversion. And, and you look at some of these so-called fascist leaders, um, you know, the reason they're opposed to democracy is not because they're against their own people, but it's, they, they understand uh, what its intent truly, truly is. Exactly. And, you know, as, as you said before, it doesn't mean that everything that is done is always, you know, the the most loving and nicest thing. But at the same time, I, I think we have a difficulty understanding those things today because the, the conditions some people lived through and lived under were severe enough that people realized that something really, really drastic and radical has to be done. And I, I think in, to a large extent, we are very isolated from that today in, in, in America and in most European countries. We don't 
understand the need and the necessity for that. But I mean, as some other people have pointed out, that that's why you saw some countries, you know, going in and joining and fighting with the National Socialists because they saw, uh, you know, communism as a bigger threat. They had done far more damage, uh, you know, and then we can sit around today and, and, well, not we maybe, but some people, they demonize, for example, a country like, you know, Ukraine or whatever because they joined the National Socialists and fought with them. But again, it's just because we're blind to the factors that they were subjected to at the time. Yeah. Um, and, you know, we're really, they really pound this nonsense about democracy into our skulls at a, at a very, uh, a very young age. And, you know, I, I sometimes say to people, uh, you know, would they own stock in a, in a business in which everyone who worked for the company from the mailroom on up uh, got to choose their own leaders? Uh, <laughs> so, yeah. I mean, can you imagine a demagogue in the mailroom running for CEO, promising everybody a two-day work week or something? <laughs> I mean, it's right. just not, you know, it, it's not a natural uh, concept, uh, but that's very difficult to, to, to explain to people. Um, but democracy gives every man a right to be the oppressor uh, of his brother. So, I'm, I mean, I'm not opposed to the, the idea of people voting and choosing their leaders, but the you know, we have to look at it in the same way that you would look at granting driver's licenses. We, we don't allow blind people uh, to get behind the wheel of a car. Exactly. We don't allow 10-year-olds to get behind the wheel of a car. So democracy could be viable if, if there is a, an educational process and, and, and the voters, you know, can, can demonstrate the ability to think critically and logically and have a base of knowledge. But my goodness, like here in America, for example, we now have people who are not only uh, illiterate in English, in, but they're in, illiterate in the language of the country they came from. Uh, we have people here from Mexico don't even speak or read Spanish. They still speak some of the ancient languages from the old Mayan days. And these people are giving, you know, ballots and told how to vote. I, I mean, this is madness. Yeah. Uh, this is the madness of democracy. Well, I think too, Mike, it's because the elite know... Uh, they've turned it into a science of how to manipulate the masses and they can put any champion in front of them and push anything they want to in the media and people would will largely apply to that. So it's it's still down to, if you want to look at it objectively, that, you know, sure, okay, you get a vote, but who has influenced you to vote and why did you make that choice? It's still down to that very factor of who has the power to to influence who controls the media and we're back in the same department again so it's largely a, a facade and i think that this makes them look good but the fact is the the main decision making still lies in the hand of those who control the information flow you know yeah and, and that is why democracy or this pure form of democracy is intrinsically uh, dishonest because the, the true rulers are always concealed so you have a system like that how, how can anything good come out of it when the whole thing is based on an illusion, you know, you, you build something on the foundation of a lie, which is that, you know, the people are in charge. Uh, you build something on a lie. The whole damn structure has to be rotten. Yep. You bet. Now, let me ask you about something again about, about the, the Roth shields, uh, the red shields, the family. Have you come any closer to finding out if they are religious in any capacity? capacity are they into the you know the kabbalah or talmudists or anything like this do you think that there is a a, a different uh, drive behind everything there beyond just getting more money and getting more power well it, it could be but i suspect if that's the case it's, it's hidden uh certainly on, on the surface it does not appear to be that way uh, many of their big members have married out to you know gentiles and so on. They don't appear to be religious. Uh, some of them appear to be more ethnocentrist than others do. Um, but, you know, it, it's hard to say what goes on, uh, you know, at the, at, the, at the pinnacle of this thing. Uh, there, there's certainly a lot of occult symbolism, and I, I go into this in Planet Rothschild, you know, with, with the all-seeing eye and the pyramid. I mean, this thing is pervasive. It keeps popping up. So there's, there's some spooky stuff going on, and these people are into some weird things and practices. Um, but, you know, I, I, I can't say what the actual Rothschilds believe or don't believe. 
uh, but they're still heavily involved in, in, in Israel. That's for sure. Yeah, exactly. Now, as you said, it's a large family. It's a lot of different, um, you know, branches to it as well. We, we saw a while back that they had some kind of balls and whatnot to kind of, well, you know, to kind of evoke that ice wide shot style masquerades right. and whatnot. I think there was some pictures actually coming out from that back in the, you know, early seventies or something like that. And, and, and the, the possibility that this has continued is there, of course. But as you said, it's, it's still difficult for us to, to know what they actually, the, the ideologies are of these people. Yeah, it is. Or, or, or what the, what the, uh, the end game is what well, we, we know what the end game is, but sometimes I often wonder what the world or new world order will be. How will it be? Will will there be uh, will it be a one world atheistic state, or or will it be a Jewish state, or will there be a world religion? Will it be based in Israel? I, I mean, who can say? Uh, I I sometimes ask myself: Is once they have achieved absolute power and destroyed everything, uh, will they rebuild the world into a decent thing? I mean, who who knows? Somebody knows. Uh, but, you know, there, there's elements of this thing that remain mysterious. Uh, all we know is that the, um, we are definitely in the end game of the final destruction of Western civilization and the white man. Yep, that's, that's correct. There are a couple of things related to, to that that I want to move on to and talk in a little bit here. Now, but I wanted to ask you as well, what, do you, what have you found in terms of um, the interests of Israel? I know that some people have pinned it back to that the Rothschilds, again, kind of uh, have been part of this. We know about the letter between one of the Lord Rothschilds. I forget exactly who again, but he and uh, Balfour were obviously speaking back and forth, and, and, and Balfour was kind of given the, the blessing to, to formulate Israel, and, and, and this was kind of on behalf of, of one of the Rothschilds. And if that's true, then, of course, the very inception of Israel would be intricately tied with, uh, with their interests, right? Yeah, and it's very interesting that this critical... Uh, outreach to the uh, Zionists by uh, the British, which was intended to drag America into World War I, by the way. Um, that the famous Balfour statement was addressed to Walter uh, Rothschild, Baron Rothschild. So that, yeah, that's, that, I mean, that tells you a lot as to who is behind uh, Israel. Now, it, it appears, and, and there might be different branches of the family who have gone in a different direction, because it, it, you know, it's clear that you have a radical pro-Israel expansion, pro-Zionist element of the global movement, and then and then you have another element that almost seems uh, annoyed with the existence of Israel, like trying to keep them on a leash. It's almost as if Israel is uh, screwing up other plans they have for the world. So you, we've always seen this internal conflict within this criminal enterprise. A sort sort of a rivalry among fellow criminals, the the hardcore Zionists versus the uh, the globalists. I mean, you see a recent manifestation of this with this uh, nuclear peace deal that w- uh, that was made between Obongo and uh, Iran. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. There, there's a ton of Jewish support uh, behind this, but at the same time, you have the hardcore Zionists who are totally opposed to it uh, as well. So, uh, again, we see that divide amongst these, these criminals. But on both sides, whether you're talking about a pure one-world or globalist type or the hardcore Zionist type, you see Rothschilds. So maybe this thing is controlled, too, or, or, or maybe it's just a, a division amongst these gangsters. Um, but at the, at, the, at the end of the day, they're all against us. It's still us versus them uh, in spite of their internal bickering. Yeah, I was thinking about the Iran thing too, and I think maybe it's simply one of those things where they they allow the uh, you know the the selected boogeyman to take one step or step closer towards the gun, you know, and then they say you know pick it up, and by that time it's it's of course the justification to um, to invade or go in full force. They've, they've tried, I mean, for years now of of meddle more directly with with Iran. Uh, they largely seem to have succeeded now in Syria, of course. Uh, more or less with, with ISIS, but so maybe it's just a step closer towards trying to get you know Iran involved in some way so that, so that Israel you know in 
10 months from now or 11 months from now can say, yeah, actually, they do have a new time to go in America, go do your job, right? Yeah, because ultimately, regardless of whatever pressure the world community brings to bear upon Israel to, uh, you know, to cool it, to take it easy, if Israel decides to strike Iran on its own, I, I cannot see how America would not come to their assistance. Yeah. At that point, so this <clears throat> this is not over. Um, there's a very real danger that World War Three can come out of that area if if, if Netanyahu uh, attacks Iran. And at the same time, of course, that this is going on, we have this business with uh, the globalists confronting China in the South China Sea, and then the whole mess in Ukraine. Um, so the world is on the uh, <clears throat> on the precipice of something. And one of my recent pieces at tomatobubble.com, you may have seen, was uh, a, a not-so-veiled threat by George Soros towards Russia and China threatening World War III. Yeah. Um, and that was pr probably the most, the most blatant and, and, and certainly the most concerning warning that I've seen of World War III to date because it's coming from such a huge power player who specifically use that phrase world war three yeah it's very bizarre and and um even more interesting if it is was you what you said there uh mike that he might be in the the hands of others to, there's been some question of course about how soros attained his money and whatnot but he, he's running all these ngos he's been tremendously influential in many different departments of of, of stirring up you know social unrest and whatnot and uh you know even more recently it came out that he's of course been funding the Ferguson riots and things like this, for example. So he, you know, if he's in the hands of someone else to kind of do their dirty jo job to not let the hands go back to them, then it's uh, it definitely is very, very interesting, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, Soros is a one-man wrecking crew. Um, I mean, it is incredible. But again, to me, uh, like you hinted, it appears that he he's just too front and center to really be the head of this thing. Uh, uh, I, I, sus I mean, we know he has ties to the Rothschild dynasty. Um, I, I suspect he's taking orders maybe from Jacob. Um, but, you know, I, again, we, we hear, I mean, Soros, uh, to the, the average brain-dead American, probably has never even heard of him. But certainly at least the people who follow the news somewhat, they know who he is. Uh, but, but Rothschild remains, you know, buried. Yep. But I believe I believe Jacob is behind uh, Soros. Right. And Soros is everywhere and he's semi open about it. Yeah, that's uh that's very worrying actually. Um what do you think is is coming down the line? I wanted to ask you a bit about Greece and if that's something that's going to you know people have speculated for years now of course of not only the American economy that that's going to somehow spread it was it was the, the whole scenario of what happened in Greece seems to be a complete utter fail again from the 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 left wing uh, party Syrias that was in has been in power now, and uh, and and they did I mean they they sold out the people and it was kind of expected I guess because this is all always what they do they didn't um, stand up to them and I mean what if Golden Dawn was in there I mean I sincerely think that they would have kicked out the bankers but again people are afraid of them because they have a symbol that looks like a, a swastika so we we can't have them running around uh, doing things right. Yeah, I mean, that's the real tragedy in Greece is, is, I mean, for a while, I thought Golden Dawn had a shot at really making a, a, a run, you know, a, a la the uh, National Socialist Party in the, in the 30s, and they were gaining steam, uh, and then this left-wing demagogue comes along, co-ops much of their rhetoric, uh, Golden Dawn is kind of pushed aside, harassed, some of their leaders are arrested, and I knew all along that you know, at the end of the day, um, you know, Greece would come back into the fold. I, I, I just don't see them uh, really standing up to the banksters. Um, I mean, at the end of the day, you know, Cyrus is, you know, he's a European leftist. And I'm, I'm a keen student of body language. I watched some of his meetings with uh, Merkel and, 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 and Renzi. And there's just a glow to his eyes, like he's one of them. You know, I just had a bad feeling. But I, I don't see any true people's rebellion against the EU uh, coming out of Greece. Just just a lot of noise. 
it's such a shame, you know, because it's, uh, we know that Goldman Sachs was in there early on, cooking the books, making things happen. And I mean, maybe it's speculating too much, but it's almost, you know, the whole um, celebration, the Hanukkah celebration uh, is more or less about a celebration of the murder of Greeks, right? And and uh, the, the light festival and all that, the oil, the, the oil that burned in the lamp all night or whatever it was. But it was, sure, there was also a, a slaughter and a murder of their own people that were kind of, um, going along or, or siding with, with the Greek people. But to me, uh, Mike, it almost feels like, you know, history never really ends. You know, it never, it never just ceases. And then all of a sudden we live in the modern world. These things continue to play out. There are old struggles that, that rise up to the surface again. And, and this one has almost been like it was a, it's almost like the banker's way of stabbing the origin point of Western civilization and 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 making sure that you know the final final nail in the coffin has been has been uh, you know hammered down or something. I don't know. What, what's your take on on why Greece were targeted in the way they were? Well, you, you know, you may have something there because they're very they're very poetic. They're very romantic in that sense of of, of going back to past errors. Uh, you know, I mean, they 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 still complain about what happened in Spain uh, five hundred years ago. Oh yeah. But, I mean, I, I, I mean, you go back to the Old Testament, there's verses in there that are just mind-blowing. They talk about subduing great nations that are stronger and, and more powerful than us. Uh, it talks about the use of, of interest. Uh, so, you know, th- this thing goes back 3,000 years. I mean, it might not be a direct continuity of conspiracy like the last 250 years are. But the methodology has been around for millennia. And you go back in history, Rome and Greece, you see things like the, the, the compound interest that destroys nations, the debasing of currency. Uh, you see the Jewish involvement in ancient slave trades. I, I mean, I, I, I suspect they brought many, um, many uh, sub-Saharan Africans into ancient Egypt I mean, that's only a theory, but I mean, again, you, you see in the ancient world the, the multi, multiculturalization, the, uh, the lending of money at, at, at compounding interest, the, the same techniques that bring down civilization time after time after time. And maybe they're not always engineered, uh, but nonetheless, you, you always see them. Uh, the, 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 the spreading of homosexuality, the decline of, of marriage and family. Uh, it's like a template. It just plays over and over and over again. So Yeah, I know. It really is interesting. Well, you mentioned something about Spain. Let me just, let's just talk about that a little bit because it was a very interesting thing. I I watched that with, with, with ver- very <laughs> heightened interest. It was a couple of months ago now, maybe even more actually, earlier this year sometime, when uh, all of Spain basically forgave uh, specifically the, the the Jewish community, and, and they actually granted automatic citizenship to all Jewish people in Spain, which is what, what like, or, or those who had been there or something. I, I forget exactly how many, but it all goes back to that, the expulsion of 1492. But what's interesting here is that, you know, Spain was seen as the aggressor again, of them doing something wrong, like, oh my God, they, they made the choice here, they took an action. They, they punished Jewish people out of the blue and they kick out Muslims, right? But the idea is that if you don't look at what, what, what preceded this event, Mike, you, you're losing the entire plot because, I mean, let's, let's just focus on that for a second. There were, you know, at way back in history, around, what, 700, something like that, when the majority of, it wasn't called Spain then, but the, the Visigoths had set up their empire in largely the area that's Spain today. And when they converted to Catholicism, they forcefully converted everyone else. They said, you, you know, either you have to become Catholic or, or you're out. And that's when you had the period of many what they call conversos, that people were on the outside, they were Catholic, but on the inside, when they came home, you know, behind locked doors, they, they you know, looked at, you know, the Talmud or something like that. But the fact is that many of these people who are still in power were, I think, were angered by this, this forceful, either uh, that they forced them out or forced them to convert to Catholicism, that you know, the, some of the city gates actually were open to the Muslim hordes in the seven, late 1700s, of in, both in, in Toledo, in, 
in Malaga, in the, there's a number of other city states where, where the gates were opened and the Muslims managed to come in and take over control. And what's interesting here is that it took the Spanish people, what was left of it at the time, they, they retreated to the north, and it took them 700 years to get their country back. And, and it was not until 1492 then when uh, Queen, was it Elizabeth, um, not Elizabeth, um, Isabella. Uh, exactly, Isabella. She took that final step and said, basically, she said, never again, that's it, you're out because of, of, of the immense struggle that they had um, gone through there. And I think that's also part of the, the fervent expansion phase that Spain entered into consequently. They had picked up a kind of a, a very ferocious uh, attitude towards their religion of Catholicism and whatnot. But it was almost like this was the momentum that took 700 years to build up. And then we see like an explosion of the Spanish Empire through, throughout that. But my point is, it's a long story, but my point is, it's very interesting to see how they zoom in on one little piece of history and only looking at 1492 and saying, see what the what errors the Spanish people did without recognizing anything that had come before. I mean, it's, it's, it's a crime to history and it's a crime to the Spanish people, this thing. Well, you know, it, it, it's interesting what, what you're saying because it, it, it aligns perfectly with a, a Russian proverb that I only discovered a few days ago and it really struck me. Uh, and it goes like this. It says the um, the Jew will always tell you what was done to him, but he never tells you why. Yeah, I mean that's it's true. It's, it is true. It's so it's it, it's it's always the always the uh, the reaction that they talk about, but they never get into the initial action that drove people uh, to that point. And and with regards to the uh, the forced conversions. Um, you know, that was always against the policy of the Catholic Church, and was it was something that the Spaniards were never really interested in. What, the deal they made to the, uh, the Jews is that important positions were always, were only to be held by Spaniards and, and Catholics, but some of these Jews were fakers. So it, it wasn't that they wanted to convert the whole of, of, of Jewry; it's they were looking to smoke out the Moranos, and that's what the Inquisition was all about. Uh, you know, you say you're a Spaniard now, you say you're a Catholic, but, you know, we're not so sure we're going to in, in, investigate this. Yeah. So. And they had good reason. That That's my point, Mike. They had they had good reason to look into this. Yeah. Yeah, they brought it on themselves by pretending to be Catholics. Um, so had they just stayed Jews and not bothered people, there would never have been an inquisition. Yeah. It's it's just incredible. It's, uh, it's such a shame that they you know people don't know the history and why some of these things happen, and it's such a misunderstanding. And I, I, we've seen the same thing happen again and again throughout history. That just as you say, the the reaction is being bullified, but not the the actions that actually caused the reaction to begin with. How how let's talk about the this recent situation with the Pope, I guess as well, because he's bending over back or backwards to uh, appease the. The, uh, the the powers that be, he's more well, left wing than than traditional in any kind of Catholic sense. He's you know pushing income equality and all these kinds of things. But even even despite this, it seems that he's not doing e enough. Then there's going to actually be a a court by the Sanhedrin now to actually uh, judge Pope Francis to be an anti Semite of all things, despite the fact that he's as I said bent over backwards to to appease the various uh, communities around the world. Well, what can you say about the Pope and what's happening to the the Catholic Church right now? Well, you know, I I refer to him as Satan's Pope, <clears throat> <laughs> <laughs> but you, you know my um, my alarm bells start, were ringing two years ago when the previous Pope uh, resigned, which is something that has not happened in six hundred years. They typically don't resign. He was healthy. He was able-bodied. Uh, why, why did he resign? Uh, following this imposter who replaced him for two years now, I am convinced that this is not just a, uh, a weak-minded, liberal-leaning, well-meaning uh, individual. I mean, I, I believe he is a, a full-blown Marxist, and this goes back to his days as a, a cardinal in Argentina, and before that, just as a, as a priest. Uh, and I'm going back 30 years looking into his background, found some very uh, disturbing information about this individual. So this is not, um, you know, the, something he's doing on a whim, this business of promoting the uh, the hoax of global warming, 
and this and this mantra of his of, of income inequality. Uh, I, I truly believe he is a Marxist who was installed in the Vatican in much the same way that Obama was installed uh, in the White House. So he's he's a total disaster. I mean, there's a reason why the left wing media loves him. I mean, this man has said nothing uh, to promote virtue or condemn sin. Uh, he says nothing about homosexuality and transgenderism that is sweeping through the world at this moment. Uh, he says nothing about the murderous wars of the United States and Israel. Um, I mean, he doesn't get into sin. The only thing that he's passionate about is income inequality and um, and global warming. Um, but it, it's deeper than that. I mean, he's... Uh, uh, I had a story on tomatobubble.com about when he was a priest the, and the, Ar the Argentinian military regime at that time was cracking down on communist subversives. Uh, one of these communists came to him as a priest and asked him to hide his, uh, her actually, asked him to hide her subversive communist books in the seminary. And he did that for her. <laughs> so, I mean, wh why is a, a suspected communist subversive going to this particular priest to say, can you hide my contraband for me? Uh, but there's countless such stories. It's, this guy's a disaster. Yeah, I mean, he's he praised Sweden. It was, uh, I think it was 2014, early 2014. It was hitting on Vatican Radio talking about how the reason why Sweden was so great is because basically Sweden has opened its borders. Uh, and, and he loves that kind of anything that basically helps to destroy the uh, homogeneity of, of Europe. He's, he's, he's all for it, you know. So he's, he's very much in that vein of, of being a, a progressive. So what's curious about all this, though, is that why the... Uh, why the Sanhedrin would go after him. But I don't think it's about that. I think it's more of a symbolic thing again. I don't think personally they have anything against Pope Francis because as I said, he's, he's bending over backwards. But the, the, this Jewish religious high court, uh, the, the Jerusalem Sanhedrin declared that they're putting him on, a, on, on trial unless he retracts his statement that, uh, that Jews have no right in the, to the land of Israel or to, or to Jerusalem, you know, so that, that's what it's over. But, Nonetheless, I mean, they, it's this small internal division, basically. Uh, I guess he's, he's a little bit too much left for them. I guess that's the problem. Well, again, it goes back into that internal power struggle between the, the hardcore Zionists and the, uh, the globalists. Um, you know, Pope Francis is of the globalist Marxist camp. who They would, they would rather see Israel just uh, behave itself because it makes... It makes the building of a new world order difficult when, when Israel does what it does. Um, so that's an internal spat among the, the elite. Um, you know, the Zionists will attack George Soros often for that, for that same reason. So think of um, Pope, Pope Francis as, you know, part of the Zor George Soros end of the, uh, the crime gang. But the fact that these, these particular Zionist Jews are opposed to him uh, in no way should that be misinterpreted as uh, Jewry uh, worldwide is in opposition to him. Quite the contrary. The Marxist Jews absolutely love this creep. <laughs> you know, we have uh, much more to discuss in the, in the second, Mike. I, I, you've written about so many good things in the, in the last uh, time since you were on, but I definitely want to ask you about Donald Trump. Very interesting. I'm going to ask you about the HUD program that Obama is pushing right now to you know, bring uh, diversity to uh, to neighborhoods that are too white. Um, there's a lot of interesting things here that's been happening. It's going so fast. Look at the attack of the on the Confederate flag and and the way the gay marriage w went through. And it's just it's oof, it's just going too quick to be able to report on it even. But nonetheless, Mike, let, before we take a break here and get into some of those topics in the second, as I said, let's just give out some of the details about. First of all, we talked about Planet Rothschild so far. Uh, mention some of the details about that. But then also, I want to speak more about my side of the story in the second hour, but we won't be able to get into too much detail right now. But give us some of the details about the book and if there's anything else you'd like to let our audience uh, know about, Mike. Well, my side of the story is sort of a whimsical play on, on Mein Kampf. Uh, so it's, it's my side of Hitler's stories. And it's Hitler's own words. What, what I did is I dug up a dozen or so wartime speeches or just before the war that make the case or present his side of the story as to who started the war and why he did what he did. And this takes you step by step. 
it explains why the invasion of Poland, why the invasion of, uh, of Belgium and Holland, why the invasion of Greece and Yugoslavia, why the invasion of the Soviet Union. All the way through, it gives his side, side of the story. But there is actual speeches. There's hardly any editorializing from me. Um, this was pretty much just a, a cut and paste job of his speeches. And they're somewhat abridged. But you read this, and you will know exactly what the German version of events was at that time. And in my introduction, I asked the rhetorical question, shouldn't we at least know what their side of the story was? Exactly. Whether you, were, whether you agree with it or not. Um, and that's what it's about. But they're very powerful speeches and also a few communiques that were issued at the time by the German foreign ministry. And that book will give you a total understanding of World War II. Uh, and I invite the reader at the end of the book to, to uh, look into my other book, The Bad War, and, and then make up your own mind as to whether or not uh, Hitler is telling the truth in these speeches. So that's what my side of the story is all about. Well, very important. Uh, I definitely want to ask you a little bit more about some of the details there. And, and then, as I said, the planet Rothschild you have out, that's two volumes. Uh, I think you wrote them with uh, Jeff Rents as well. Is that is that correct? Oh, no. Jeff Rents only did the forward. Okay, yeah, but he's part yes, of it. Right. Yep. Right. He wrote a very nice forward for my book and also The Bad War. The cover art is by the the great David Dees. So, I mean, these are really handsome, eight and a half by 11 books. Um, and you can see all of my books right there listed at the front page at tomatobubble.com. Uh, and it, it's, you know, I, I have a certain, uh, there, there's a certain signature to all of my work. I mean, it's all simplicity, uh, easy to read text, lots and lots of pictures, gets right to the point. And, you know, so all, all of my books are, you know, in that same, that same genre. I guess you call it a sort of uh, cliff notes. <laughs> right. Well, we need that, uh, you know, overview sometimes. And we do need uh, clarification, I would say, because sometimes it gets it can get so, so detailed. And, and I mean, don't get me wrong. I, I think we need the details and we need all levels to it. But after you've gone through some of the details, there are ways we can summarize and, and make things, uh, you know, clearer. So that's something you do very well. So So I urge people who want to read more, of course, uh, go to tomatobubble.com and uh, check out the books. Of course, you have your author author's page on uh, Amazon.com as well, where you have all the, uh, the the links up. Is there any other uh, website we should give out, Mike, before we wrap up for the first well, segment? The, the author page is listed under msking at Amazon.com. Uh, so if you want to, someone wants to look me up as the author, look for Ms. King, or they can just go to tomatobubble.com and link directly to the author page. All right. Very good. Um, well, folks, we'll, we'll take a short break here and then we'll be back in a second with uh, more with uh, Mike King. Stay with us, Mike. We'll be right back. Well, folks, in the second hour, as we proceed with Mike King, we are going to go into the treacherous swamp that is the war on whites. We are going to talk about the attack on Europeans in their own countries. And it's not with bombs and guns and violence as much, although this is an increasing factor as well now with the multiculturalism and the increased unsafe areas in many cities built by Europeans. But it's a psychological warfare and demoralization that is the goal. We'll go into some of the new terms like white privilege that are intended to have people self-censor and single themselves out as a problem just because they are white. We'll talk about how people in the media, universities, politicians, and also people in government quite openly can talk about the displacement of us and the agenda of breeding us out to make us minorities in our own countries. There is an endless stream of hatred that is being poured our way. And this really reveals the nature of the hostile elites that are now running the Western world as well. As we move on, we're going to talk about how many children growing up in this environment of self-hatred have been zombified by the media and the indoctrination in the education system, and now they're not fighting back. There is no self-preservation, no self-interest, which comes perfectly natural to everyone else. But not to us, because if we do it, it's hate. If we do it, it's bigotry. So good little obedient libtards are now salivating at the ring of the Pavlovian racism bell. It's an enormous psychological operation, propaganda on a massive scale that has put people in a frozen deadlock, unable to act and unable to realize how the globalists are using this against them to win. 
In fact, they will even police each other now and try to outcompete each other at who can show the other to be even more obedient to the PC tyranny than the idiot next to them. We'll uh, also talk about Donald Trump's campaign, the uh, anti-white undertones of the new Genghis Khan exhibit, a uh, mass murderer that is perfectly fine to celebrate and have an exhibit to, while they're of course taking down statues of Confederate generals in the United States. We also talk about the utter hypocrisy of the MTV production called White People. But we'll begin to uh, talk about Obama's HUD program of basically trying to make white neighborhoods less white. Because remember, too many white people in a row is a microaggression. That's right. Google it and you will find it. White microaggression. So let's place Section 8 housing and people who can't afford the house in a particular neighborhood next to those who can afford it. And let's have the government subsidize it because everyone deserves access to safe, clean, but of course boring and evil white privileged neighborhoods. If you want to hear more of the second hour, check out the website redicemembers.com. That's where you can hear the uh, second hour and any of our previous shows in uh, full as well. We have over a thousand programs there for you. You can stream or download radio shows, videos, inside episodes, all Radio 314 shows and more. Thank you for listening to the first hour, but we'll be right back with the second after a short break. You know, had Napoleon remained in, in power, uh, you know, the New World Order could not have advanced. So he had to be destroyed because he was, he was totally opposed to uh, money lending. And what an epic struggle that was. It was, you know, in a sense, it was uh, parallel to the struggle in the 20th century against Hitler. Uh, but Rothschild financed the downfall of Napoleon. And that was you know, a huge triumph for them. And they not only came out, you know, more powerful, but they really never had a true uh, challenge against them until Hitler came along more than 100 years uh, later. So things like that I, I spend a lot of time on uh, in the book. And then in, in America, there was a similar uh, move against them. That would have been the rise of President Andrew Jackson, who killed America's central bank. Uh, so there's a, there's a whole story there. Uh, yeah, it was another seven. After he killed the bank, it was another 70 years be, before they could finally set up the, the Federal Reserve System. So that was a huge setback in America, uh, what Andrew Jackson did. You know, I was wondered because when we have rights of some of these dictators, uh, well, so to speak, dictators, they have, uh, you know, tried to do something which m most people are, I, I think incapable of, of understanding in terms of, well, really try to clean house and, and take care of some of the major problems that we have. And I'm not saying that there aren't those that have risen to power, of course, that are in the hands of the very same uh, banking families and what have you. But it's interesting because usually we, ha we to me, it's kind of clear that when you have this very cut and dry demonization of certain, uh, you know, people that have risen in history, you know that good chances that they were actually trying to take out some of the competition that we're trying to clean house and take care and, and restore some kind of, uh, you know, pride either to the, the country itself or maybe even to the entire European union. Where, where are there others that have risen and try to, uh, take care of this issue in the past? Uh, yeah, well, the, the big ones, the, the,
big challenges would have been Napoleon, Andrew Jackson, um, and Hitler. Uh, in a modern context, one could say uh, Putin and, and, and China. Uh, and, and then throughout history, there, there have been many smaller players who have defied this force and paid the price for it. Uh, if we want to be a little bit simplistic, one can say you can judge the degree of, of a man's commitment to his own people uh, by the, um, the, le the level of filth that is dumped on his head by the press. And, and so you look, whether it's a Saddam Hussein or a, a Muammar Gaddafi, uh, or you go back in history, a Mussolini or someone like that. Uh, tip, I mean, you, you, see, you see the pattern. The more negatively someone is portrayed, and this is not to suggest that they're all perfect and saints. Sure, yeah, of course. Uh, that, that, that is the pattern. You look closely and you see someone who is generally opposed to the debt-based monetary system uh, that the Rothschilds are at the heart of. Conversely, all of the so-called great and good statesmen of the last few hundred years, uh, you look a little closer and, and you can discern that those are the puppets that were you know, placed in power to, uh, to move the game forward. And that's pretty much the story of history of the last 250 years. You can just uh, kind of reverse everything you hear. The good guys are more or less the bad guys, and the bad guys are more or less truly the good guys. And it's an amazing pattern that comes up time and time and, and time again. When you, when you this is Red Ice Radio for the Seeker. Welcome, ladies and gents. Thank you for stopping by today. We are always delighted here at Red Eyes Radio to have you with us. Thank you for tuning in. My name is Henrik, and this is a non-conformist, free-thinking, and critical, independent radio program that opposes all the uh, current politically correct nonsense that is uh, leading to horrible self-censorship and a horrible climate of fear and repression with uh, cultural Marxism as the ruling ideology, whether people are actually smart enough to realize that or not. We oppose the globalists and the bankers and their lying politicians, and uh, we sense that they will do to us what they have done to, for example, Greece, and that their policies against us ultimately are revealing themselves to be extremely hostile to who we are. We are concerned for the future of Western civilization, and the European peoples, and we are proud guardians of our interests unapologetically. We are also into global politics, basically trying to understand why things are the way they are. Health, science, new technology, conspiracies, secret societies, corruption, political subversive movements, history, culture, archaeology, and much more. We are, to uh, make things simple, looking for the truth, and we are uh, not afraid to bring people on to uh, talk about the findings along the way. On our website, redeyescreations.com, redeyesradio.net, and redeyesmembers.com, we have much more for you to uh, check out. Our guest today is uh, Mike King. He's been with us a couple of times before. He is a private investigative journalist and researcher based in the New York City area. His 27-year career in marketing and advertising has equipped him with a unique perspective when it comes to understanding how public opinion is scientifically manufactured. Welcome back, Mike. It's uh, good to speak with you again. I hope you've been doing well. And uh, as always, it's a, it's a pleasure to have you with us. Uh, it's good to be back, Henrik. Yes, we're keeping busy, uh, try, trying to keep up with uh, these rapid flow of events that are unfolding. Yeah, it seems like it's going quicker now than than ever before. We have we have so many things we want to want to speak about, and of course, as you said, you've been keeping busy since we last uh, spoke. A lot of interesting articles on TomatoBubble.com, but also, of course, uh, and by the way, I'm really enjoying your anti New York slimes post. Uh, a couple of great stories there that we uh, hopefully can get a chance to discuss a bit later as well. But um, I wanted to talk a little bit about some of your latest books first before we get into some of the other topics we have lined up here for today but you have uh well since we last spoke i think you have multiple outs you have mind mind side of the story key world war ii addresses of 
Adolf Hitler, um, which, which of course is outrageous to actually try to listen to what he actually said as opposed to what people believe he said, etc. But then you have um, Killing of America, 100-Year Murder, 40 Historical Wounds Bill O'Reilly didn't write about. And also you have a two volumes of Planet, Planet Rothschild, The Forbidden History of the New World Order. And neither of these books is a small topic and we can do a program on each book separately of course but let's see if we can make uh, them some justice here and talk about each of them for a little bit here and i wanted to begin on planet rothschild first it was actually a few uh years ago now on red eye since we kind of dedicated a show talking more about the rothschild family this is of course immensely wealthy rich enough to finance the war to defeat napoleon who was opposed to usury uh, and he played the war in such a way as to multiply his fortune by as much as 20 times. So it, the the fortune, the Rothschild fortune, is, is just unimaginable. Uh, I mean, some people feel they may actually, you know, as, the, as an entity, be the world's first and only trillionaires. Uh, but that's, that's, that's the key, the capture of the, uh, the, the British Empire. Because that's what led to the defeat of Napoleon, who was uh, very much feared by the the early New World Order. Interesting. Yeah, I mean, what what would you say about? Um, as you said, though, I mean, they, they have so much money; it's it's um, kind of difficult to estimate. I've heard some people estimate, and it's you know, in my view, we, there's just no way of knowing with all the different assets and whatnot. But one thing we've noticed, of course, is that they very much. Uh, they're a very quiet family. They're they're kept largely out of the media. They do surface a little bit here and there, some controversy, some scandals with, you know, with buyouts. There's been rumors of involvement in in various things. But how do they manage to stay out of the media? Are they? Do you know, Mike, if they're directly in ownership in control of some of the large uh, media companies? Because it seems to be kind of a an agreed upon topic to to not write too much about them. Well, what, one thing I've noticed about them is in all of their their ownership techniques, it's, it's like they're there, but they're hidden. It's, it's very similar to, uh, you know, the, the way the mafia, the Italian mafia or, or used to operate in, in America. They, they might have a front man owning the hotel, uh, but the details of the true ownership is kind of, you know, arcane. It's, it, it's hard to get at. So they've always been there, like amongst the elite. Everyone knows who they are. Uh, in terms of the the public, they still to this day kind of remain always somewhat under the radar, which indicates to me that they still are uh, the true power. Uh, I, I believe they are. They continue to be the power behind George Soros, for example, who by comparison is very open uh, in public. And you know, by this time, it's um, there's a lot of other players who are part of this thing, and it's hard to say if the Rothschilds are the absolute pinnacle. Uh, it, to me, it seems more like an oligarchy, oligarchy at this point, a conspiracy among elite equals. Uh, but certainly, up until you know, First World War, World War II, they were the at the apex of the, of the new world order, and and they still might be, although there's very, you know, there there, there are other big players uh, to be sure. Right. To this day, they, I mean, you'll see them, you'll see some of these uh, Rothschilds maybe make a cameo appearance on a BBC or something like that. They're not totally hidden, um, but they're they're not out there front and center to the degree that a uh, a George Soros or a David Rockefeller is. Isn't that kind of ridiculous, though, when you think about the progressive and liberal media that can attack, you know, the as I said, the Koch brothers and they go after them like they own the world and everything. Like, oh, my God, they donated it to the GOP, but they largely never discussed the real, you know, major big power players, which is indicative of how kind of phony and, and controlled the uh, these kinds of exposés are. Well, this whole business of uh, tax the rich and attack the rich. Uh, is is something that, to quote, there's a family that the mainstream media never writes about. They they can spend a huge amounts of time and effort, you know, attacking some, you know, like the Koch brothers or something like that, but they never talk about the Rothschild and how 
powerful this this Jewish uh, banking family is. Tell us a bit first of um, you know how you approached the topic, Mike, and, and why you wanted to write a book on on the Rothschilds. Well, uh, you know this this thing, this two hundred and fifty year old uh, drama that we call the New World Order, uh, which uh, I'm sure most of your listeners know, dates back uh, to about the time of the French Revolution. Uh, at its heart, has always been this uh, this family. Uh, it's not just the Rothschilds, of course, uh, but without them, it's it's hard to envision how this effort could have proceeded. And when you understand that, uh, you get a better picture of the continuity. You know, people often say, well, why would all these conspirators engage uh, in this massive effort that which they knew would never come to fruition during their lifetime? But when you see the bloodlines going from century to century to century, uh, you know, it begins to make sense. And and that's where the uh, the book starts, Planet Rothschild, 1763 to 2015. It's a two-volume set. And, and I begin with the foundation of the House of Rothschild in 1763. And I go through all the major events of the last 250 years. And you see the influence of this family throughout. Whether it was the um, uh, Nathan Rothschild's single-handed financing of the defeat of Napoleon, right up to the modern day, we see the Rothschilds involved in Israel and in the global warming hoax. And it's just incredible how this has passed. It truly is a dynasty. Um, they are at the heart of planet Rothschild. And it's essential to understand this family if you're going to understand the big picture of things. Tell us a bit about how you think they actually managed to get um, the the control that they did in in Europe at the time because I mean obviously as we know there was um, many you you know European countries were uh, were, were throwing out uh, the Jewish people from various locations it was over eleven hundred places over a, an eight hundred year period uh, from small little chiefdoms and areas to to entire countries but uh, it was the Jewish emancipation emancipation didn't occur until 18, 1850, something like that. And I've always been curious about how they managed to get such a control. And, and it, I mean, is it as simple as some have said that it was basically a, um, they were in a position to lend money to various kings that were engaged in war, etc. Or how did they get that foot in the door, if you will, Mike? Well, the, um, the big, I mean, the big move was, well, you know, they had the, the five sons of the original Rothschild branched out to five different countries, uh, Britain, France, uh, Frankfurt in Germany, uh, Austria, and then what was known at, at the time as the Kingdom of uh, Naples. But the biggest brother of all was, was Nathan. And what Nathan managed to do is conquer England. And England at that time, um, and for several centuries, uh, was what the United States was today, meaning if you control the United Kingdom, you can leverage that power uh, to control uh, the world, essentially. So although you had the five brothers in five different lands, it, it, the key to this was Nathan in London, who uh, by the time Napoleon came on the scene, he, Nathan Rothschild was already... Uh, Michael Corleone from The Godfather, he's, he once said that income taxes are a trick of the rich to keep the others without. <laughs> so uh, but it, it, it is interesting, all of these mega, mega billionaires, I mean, forget about the Koch brothers, people like that, that's jump change. I'm talking about the really big boys, you know, your, your George Soros and your Warren Buffett and your Rockefellers and your Rothschilds. Uh, they are the 1% of the 1% and they're all left wing. So, you know, really, there's a, the attack on the so-called rich is, is an attack on the, the entrepreneurial class. The real rich, the real big shots, uh, they never get touched. And, and they're the ones who are behind this demagoguery of, uh, you know, tax the rich and so on. Yeah, I mean, what, what do you think their involvement was in terms of the rise of... Uh of of socialism and and communism as a way of kind of by proxy to take over uh you know what what we saw in Russia etc are they are there fingerprints all over that as well Oh yes absolutely uh you know the western financiers the jewish financiers financed the russian revolution 
And they've always financed and promoted communism and socialism and big government and liberalism, progressivism, whatever, whatever euphemism you want to use. Uh, they're always at the center of it. Now, if you look at it superficially, that appears to be somewhat of a paradox, but it's not because you see big government borrows money and goes deeper and deeper into perpetual debt to these people. So their, their love of big government has nothing to do with altruism or wealth redistribution. No, big government, I mean, that is your ultimate customer. I mean, if you're a blood-sucking moneylender, uh, you prefer a, a big debtor over a small debtor. And who's bigger than the government? And, and that's the key to understanding everything. These people love big government. And, and through that big government, they control the world. And they've got us all in debt perpetually. Yeah, this is how they play the game, of course. And uh, you think that some of these groups are in opposition to each other, or you would think that certain political ideologies w would fight the the uh, the real, you know, capitalists, if you will, the, the real money power. But as I said, they never kind of come to light in in that capacity. What what would you say are some of the kind of major events that stand out? I know that you you know you um, you go through the chronology of of events of and and there's a lot there to discuss, and we can't go into them all of course but what what are some of the things that stand out to you when you were writing the book mike and some of the things we should just kind of uh, uh make our listeners aware of well um to to me the, the the most important events would be those points in history in which these people were challenged uh nearly defeated uh, sometimes even were defeated but then always come back and win uh in the end and they come out stronger. And probably the first major move against these people was the rise of Napoleon. How many people know that Napoleon Bonaparte passed a decree against money lending? It was called the infamous decree. And, you know, I've got some quotes in there in Planet Rothschild from some of the things he wrote about usury. And, and, and although publicly, he was always, uh, you know, portrayed himself as a tolerant, as a friend of the Jews. Privately, like in things like letters to his brother, you know, he wanted to assimilate them out of existence. And he had a, a very um, negative view of them and, and, and money lending. But there, there's no question that uh, 